Greetings, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades. Did you know that there is a novel that has been written? It's a Catholic novel that predicted the most important elements of the milieu of the 266th pontificate. There are actually a couple of them. Right now, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades, I am currently doing a read-through, group reading, week by week, of one of these novels. I'd call it the second prophetic Catholic novel in the latter 20th century, latter half of the 20th century, and that is Windswept House. In many ways, this is the better known one. It's a good novel, very good even, um, and it proceeds a little bit more slowly than the one I'm going to talk to you today about, but it, written in 1996, definitely predicts in very specific terms the milieu of the Francis Pontificate. Many of you know this one. The novel that is even faster paced, more exciting, and predicts in some thematic ways more of the Francis Pontificate from the very next year, 1997, is none other than Michael O'Brien's Father Elijah. Father Elijah might well be, excluding The Lord of the Rings and Dostoevsky, my favorite novel of all time, contemporary novel, let's just say that. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a correspondence that made a great difference to me in my life with the author, Michael O'Brien. Our circumstances, he's a Canadian, I'm an American, he's a generation above me, as uh, fathers, uh, imp impoverished fathers, with many kids, uh, were very similar and he gave me great advice and it figures into not only my life but even my apostolate, my ministry, whatever you want to call what we do here on Rules for Retrogrades, very, very privately and publicly. And I've talked about it in fits and spurts here and there. You might have seen me talk about it. You might not have known I was talking about Father Elijah or Michael O'Brien. I'm going to give you the whole story today, and I'm going to play some absolutely spellbinding clips from an interview that Michael O'Brien did with Father Fessio of Ignatius Press, his book publisher, 10 years ago. It is insane in, in a good way, insofar as it shows that this humble, humble, holy man, Michael O'Brien, prophetic man, might have actually re received the contents of Father Elijah as private inspiration. Let me just say this before we get going. Um, we're going to be doing a uh, reading of this novel starting the first day of summer. It's a patrons-only event. Now that we're in June and our first, uh, our first meeting for this book club, Father Elijah book club, will be June the 21st, I wanted to say, hey, become a patron today, all levels will be welcome to join for this reading. Book clubs are something that I'm very excited to start doing as a patron host. And I got the idea from my friend, quite frankly, who started doing this book club and, and having me co-host it once a week on Windswept House. We're bringing that book to a close. And as soon as we finish, June 21st kicks in and I will be doing Father Elijah. Might even have Frank uh, join us occasionally. But so just the, the other thing is become a patron today, even at the lowest levels, you can get this benefit of joining once a week for a book club. People love it. It's a lot of fun. Summer is the time for fiction. Summer is the time for fiction. Stretch out with your back against a tree like Frodo in the West Farthing of the Shire. Read an exciting, frightening, prophetic book like Father Elijah or Windswept House. Do it today. So become a patron of this channel, timothyjgordon.com. Okay, and also buy our books, Case for Patriarchy, Ask Your Husband on Timothy J. Gordon today. Go to realestateforlife.com, no, .org. Go to realestateforlife.org and get yourself to one of the blessed red states here in the American South where true Catholic Americanism can live and thrive. Go to realestateforlife.org today. Okay, a little bit about Father Elijah. This book predicts from 1997 what has happened in the 266th pontificate over the last nine years. The confluence of forces 
inside and outside of the church leading to globalism, church collusion with globalism, higher up cardinals who conspire with the globalists. Does this sound a little bit like Windswept House? Yes, if you know that novel, it does. What I can say is this. These books written together in 1996 and 1997, when John Paul II's Parkinson's disease was amping up, they both are like prophecies. Cardinals in the church working to bring down John Paul II. Both books talk about this. Now, what's remarkable, as you know, and I know, we're sitting here in the middle, the sixth month, the middle month of 2022. There's a lot of water under the bridge, folks, for faithful Catholics, for Orthodox Catholics. 25 years after the penning of these two books, and now... Father Elijah is not only the world's, it's one of the most exciting books I've ever read. Windswept House is really prophetic, not, not quite as fast paced, but, um, but, but a really exciting book as well. Now they make more sense. And here's the thing, as we sit here entering into the 10th year of Francis's pontificate, think about this. Both of these books, Windswept House and Father Elijah, are in some way, some form with differing levels of emphases about the attempt by Sankt Gallen Mafia types within the, the Curia and the Cardinalate to bring to an end, an untimely end, the pontificate of John Paul II, called the Slavic Pope by Malachi Martin in Windswept House. The transfer, commutatively almost, of the abrupt end of John Paul the second's papacy to Benedict the Sixteenth, his successor, who was seen as ideological and theological successor to John Paul II, especially by his enemies more than by conservatives, seems real. The transfer, John Paul II's pontificate, in other words, did not come to the swift, untimely, forfeited end that these two authors, Michael O'Brien and Malachi Martin foresaw. They are both talking about something real, my friends, parish orphans and retrogrades. And what they were talking about, what they foresaw, was a mafia type, Gallen Group mafia type, working with globalists demonically, in the case of uh, Father Elijah, working with the Antichrist, who is the leader of the free becoming less free world, the Antichrist, to do a whole bunch of stuff, one of those things being to bring to an end the reign of the Slavic Pope. This transferred. This didn't come to pass under John Paul II. The enemies of John Paul II, the mafia group, mafia club, Gallen group, whatever you want to call them, led by guys like Cardinal Walter Casper, they ended up transferring their most direct energies to the successor of John Paul II, who is a major character in Father Elijah, but not in Windswept House. He's a minor character in Windswept House. Who am I talking about? Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. He's a major character in the latter novel, though, Father Elijah. I, I say the superior novel. I say the much more exciting novel, but they're both really good, and I have really come to respect Malachi Martin in a way that, as all you know, I didn't, I didn't necessarily before. So it, this is really odd. I want you all to reflect after, you know, going into the 10th year of the Francis pontificate, you know, eight and a half years under us, mm. how odd this is that these two prophets within the church, you know, Michael O'Brien's more like a true prophet. I'm going to show you some, some interview clips. Malachi Martin is more like an insider, private secretary to uh, Augustine Cardinal Bea, viewer, he says, of the third secret of Fatima. They were both convinced with, with a lot of evidence, what we would call fine evidence, up close, granular detail, that John Paul II was being forced out by his diabolical, diabolical, devil-worshipping lieutenants. They both agree on this point. Novel written in 1996, novel written in 1997, 
What's the deal with that? It didn't come to pass. Well, it's probably that, as you and I now know, the Parkinson's overcame John Paul II, and so they saw no need to end his pontificate because they, the bad guys in the Curia and the Cardinal, were able to do more or less whatever they wanted. The greater threat was preventing the, rat, the presumptive Ratzinger pontificate, which is the express purpose of the Mafia Club, in a direct admission by Cardinal Daniels. So they're like, look, JP2 is dangerous to us, so they thought, but his Parkinson's has made him actually not dangerous to us. Let's not end this pontificate. This is what both of the authors of the two novels I'm talking about today missed somehow. But the theological and philosophical program of JP2 will be continued, a restorative program. All of us have our critiques from the Catholic Orthodox right of the restorative program of JP2 and Benedict. I know them now. So you don't need to comment on that in the, the commentary box in, unless you really want to. But the enemies, the guys that know much more than we do about what was really going on inside the church in the late 90s and early 2000s, they saw as a greater threat to the spirit of Vatican II, the diabolical takedown of the Roman Catholic Church from within, as the new pope who would carry forward with perhaps greater energies the JP2 program after the JP2 pontificate. That is Ratzinger. And look what happened. Neither of these guys did predict that the Ratzinger pontificate would be ended. We still don't know what the details on the end of the, the Ratzinger pontificate were, the Benedict pontificate. But both of these novels are interestingly about something that had not happened in eight centuries. Windswept House, Father Elijah. A pope being brought down, forced out of his... Battery. Yeah, battery. We'll, we'll all continue talking. Forced out of the Petrine throne by enemies of the pontificate. How, how is it? Is it just a coincidence? Yeah, they ask yourself this. Is it a coincidence that everyone was writing about the fact that all of these same guys, the same antagonists, I'm trying to make you see the forest for the trees, by the way, the same antagonists, Casper, Daniels, Martini, Silvestrini, et al. There, there are more Gallen group members. They are the bad guys. They're, 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 the, they're on offense. Same group. They were going to try to get JP2 out of the Petrine office. Instead, they just got his greatest lieutenant who assumed the Petrine office and the Gallen group met to first prevent Benedict from, from assuming the throne. And then after he assumed the throne, they seemed to be some sort of counterforce which might have forced him to abdicate the throne. We don't know about that yet, but it seems highly likely. Same bad guys, almost the same protagonist, JP2, with his right-hand man, called Dotrina, the prefect for doctrine, CDF, uh, Ratzinger. They, they just call him Dotrina uh, in, in Father Elijah. Michael O'Brien, the author, uh, refers to Cardinal Secretary of State as Stato, and Dotrina, the Cardinal Prefect of the CDF. So that's a big coincidence, such a big coincidence that it's not merely a coincidence. Now, I want to talk to you about this book in particular. I'm going to show you some footage from Father Elijah's author, Michael O'Brien, with Father Elijah's publisher, Father Fessio, at Ignatius, that really changed my life. So here in this clip, can we get uh, 1442 uh, going, Steph? If there's a problem hearing, we, we, this, is, this has really been inconsistent. If there's a problem hearing, I will play it. But um, starting at 14 minutes, 42 seconds through this interview, Michael O'Brien explains to Fessio how poor he was as a sacred artist raising six kids. He and his wife were both sacred artists struggling with many kids to get by. Now, as I read Father Elijah and as of I I. And as I watched this interview, I was a poor student in law school, very poor, with kids of my own, with a sick child. And, and, and the second one, you know, Abby was our first kid. We, I still, I was having bad PTSD 
from her being sick in Rome, several brain surgeries in, several new brain surgeries on the way. I'd become a full-on hypochondriac, anxiety patient. It was bad. And I was in law school just, just to, to, to feather the nest, just to ameliorate all that stress, go to law school, right? <laughs> uh, said no law student ever. And I see this, and I am having similar fits and spurts. And um, he's a bit of a slow talker, wonderful man. I wrote him, and he wrote me back like later that week. I, sh I shared with him the first two-thirds of my novel, which I've never released and is not quite finished. He is just a wonderful saint of a man. And um, uh, just the best thing Ignatius has put out ever is Father Elijah. And we're doing the reading group because it's such an amazing, it's the most exciting book I've ever read without pause. More exciting than Windswept House. In some places, even more exciting than Lord of the Rings. It, it seems privately inspired. Let's play the first clip, Steph. This is him just describing his biographical conditions. Uh, maybe it is privately inspired. We'll get more on that in clip two. Okay, can we do a poll? Yeah, let's see if that, they can hear it here. Looking for a part of writing. Oh, thank you. Uh, for most of my life, uh, raising our six children, I was my life. Uh, have considered ourselves to be a family of artists. Uh, How can you support six children by doing art? Well, only by the miraculous intervention of God constantly. And we do it very, very simply. You know, I think it's too fast, just right. a second. Let's Let go me. to 1.5 speed. He's a, he's a slow <laughs> talker, people. It's like a Seinfeld. Blessed man. I love this guy. Bit of a slow talker. So, uh, you know, we're, we're speeding him up to 1.5 speed. Oh, okay, sorry. Let's see if we can hear. Can people okay. hear? I don't know. We'll see. Um, let me see if I can start it. Now uh, you're also an artist, but it, what came first, art or writing? Art, painting. Uh, for most of my life, uh, raising our six children, my wife and I have, uh, have Alice, considered ourselves to be a family of artists. Uh, How can you support six children by doing art? Well, only by the miraculous intervention of God, constantly. And we've lived very, very simply in a remote, remote sections of Canada where uh, housing costs are very low. We've actually, over the last forty years, uh, been caretakers of wrecked trees in little mission churches which has no resident priest and so it's cost almost nothing to live there we've grown a lot of our own food at various times we've lived we've lived at a very very bottom level of society uh, and happy to be there there's been a lot of joy there struggle yeah plenty of struggle plenty of uh, terrifying moments well, well the growth season is not too long up there either rather short yeah compared yeah. to california yes but, uh, but uh, so you lived in recreation zone as a caretaker. You did painting. Yes. W w was there any economic uh, well, uh, supplement because of the painting? Yes. As the years went on, uh, my income did come from painting primarily. Uh, churches would commission a painting every now and then. Uh, often individuals, for most of my life as a painter, were our main source of income. People were often very generous to us. See, they believed in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. They saw the impossibility of it. And people would sometimes give us gifts that would just get us through another week or a month. Well, then how did the writing start? I, I mean... well, again, uh, it came as a total surprise to me. Uh, in the 19, late 1970s, I was um, deeply into painting icons and fulfilling commissions for churches and individuals. did not think of myself as a writer at all. Um, and yet this, this story kept welling up in my imagination as I was painting. And uh, this story eventually became the novel which you published uh, over 17 years later, uh, titled A Cry of Stone. It was the first novel that arose in my imagination. But it wasn't the first one you submitted to us. No. Father Elijah was the first, was it not? Uh, Father Elijah was the first. Okay. Well, you see, for, for nigh on 20 years, I kept thinking of myself as a Canadian, which I am. Uh, I kept submitting my novels, my manuscripts, to can mainline Canadian publishers. Oh, I see. And they kept sending me these somewhat cryptic letters saying, love your writing, love the story, we'd be glad to publish it, but you must understand that the religious viewpoint in this novel is no longer of interest to the reading public, <laughs> uh, meaning Orthodox Catholicism. And, uh, and in the subtlest form of invitation, they, were, they sometimes asked me to warp the Catholicism or, or simply delete it. Uh, <laughs> And that's like, we invite you to cut out your heart and soul so that we can make a success of you. Okay, can we pause there? And what the, our next mark in the second, the big clip that I really want you guys to see that is nothing short of breathtaking amazing will be at 1848. Uh, so, so, and now here's the thing. Here's a few things he said. Uh, I contacted him about 10 years ago. 
because I think it was after I've seen this clip. Um, he said that they were they, he and his wife were just caretaking for abandoned parishes living there with their six kids. I guess my, my change in station is that now I have one more kid than, than Michael O'Brien, who's a hero of mine. They, they kept going. Yeah. He's a hero of mine. And, and we've corresponded a little bit, but, you know, he's mostly off the grid. He says they sometimes got by these two sacred artists who are completely committed to what they do. This doesn't square exactly with the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant American view. That's not... Uh, I, I, but I admire it. I, I'm not a wasp, right? I'm a Catholic. I, I say he, he's, he's making it work. He lived within the full, to, to the fullness of the faith as a sacred artist, and they were poor, but they weren't starving. They grew their own food. So this is kind of like the way Steph and I were getting by in a totally different way. We weren't growing our own food. We didn't know how to do that. Right? I was just in law school after being in a PhD program, having to leave suddenly because our first kid was born in a foreign country sick. And so we were getting by in law school barely. During the summers, we would we would um, literally sometimes be struggling toward middle August to get the, the next uh, student payment on a loan and would, would be able to eat because someone gave us a Walmart gift card. Uh, a friend of mine in law school just inexplicably gave me a, a gift card. He didn't, he didn't know that we were struggling. We looked, we looked fit. We didn't look like we were starving to death. He graduated and he gave me the present. I should have given him the present. So just inexplicable little boons and graces from good people, people of God. I think he was a Protestant guy. It was bizarre, but it enabled us to eat something other than ramen to get to uh, the, the second week of August uh, when we would get our, our uh, student payment or whatever. Reminded me of O'Brien, and I had bad anxiety, like I said. So I read Father Elijah, found it the best thing I'd read in 10 years. Best thing I've read since Lord of the Rings. Most exciting book I've ever read, which is why I'm doing this group, reading group with, with, with patron patrons uh, starting June 21st. And I sent him my manuscript, what I had. He wrote back. It was marked up with comments. He's like, this is great. You have to finish this, blah, blah, blah. I think, Tim, you need to pray to the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see that he is speaking on that which he knows in the next clip. And I, I said, he said, do you not pray to the Holy Spirit for fortitude after what's happened? Your, 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 whole epic, your whole saga with Abigail in Rome, I'd given him the fast version in a letter, old-fashioned letter. I said, no, I never prayed to the third person, the Holy Spirit. Specifically, I pray, pray to the Trinity and was kind of, had recently come back fully into the church, uh, you know, within a couple of years of, of this. This is 10, 11 years ago now. So that night, and I was getting, I had, I had something like fibromyalgia, had bad IBS, had an ulcer. I was in really bad shape, dizzy all the time. Remember those days, Steffi? Oh, yeah. Going to law school, dizzy. I, we lived in a little town called Alpine uh, in the hills above San Diego because we'd just come from metropolitan Rome riding the train around, the metro, with Abby right after brain surgery. We didn't have a car in Rome. We were sick of living in a city, so... To go to law school, after I put aside the PhD temporarily, we were literally coming from Alpine, a little mountain town, and I would commute a half hour down into San Diego, and it was, it, was, it was lovely, notwithstanding the fact that I was going through bad PTSD anxiety from all of Abby's brain surgeries. And there was a little road. It was actually very close to where the Catholic Answers has their studio. It was Los Coches Road. Uh, in uh, El Cajon, uh, near a Walmart exit. And something, I was dizzy because I was so stressed out. And the inclination, the, the steep, precipitous drop in the hill there, I would always, I, bad neck tightness can cause dizziness, which caused me to worry further. Going past Los Coches Road down to my school, USD Law, I would always get freaked out and I'd be praying because I'd get extra dizzy there. Something about the, the, the cant in the road. And I'd be praying, and I'd, I'd, my hands would be hurting, my stomach would be hurting for, for months on end. was dizzy the first couple semesters of law school. It was really bad. And he said, you need to pray to the Holy Spirit. So I did this night um, and during Holy Week. Uh, sorry, during, uh, yeah, it was Holy Week. I think this is 2011, maybe 2012. We haven't been able to ascertain whether it was 2011 or 2012. Over, over a decade ago now, though. And uh, he said, pray to the Holy Spirit. I woke up at in the middle of the night, my hands were hurting. I prayed to the Holy Spirit. 
And um, that was early on Holy Thursday of 10 or 11 years ago. And I did it. I'd never done it. I just said, please give me strength. Give me fortitude. The mark of the Holy Spirit is fortitude. Went to school, went to work my job. I've told some of you this story before on other, other channels. Um, had a full day of law school and I, I was working, I think, at an oil and gas company uh, part-time uh, as a landman. And then came home. We were tutoring my friend uh, in some of his college courses, my, my good friend Kenny, Kenny and Jen, uh, who lived in our apartments with us, dear, dear friends. Went to Holy Thursday Mass and at Mass... My life changed. Um, I just prayed about 16 hours before to the Holy Spirit for the first time in my life, as advised by Father Elijah's author, Michael O'Brien. He said, look, this is what got me through. We have similar circumstances. Patriarchs who feel like we're bad providers, we feel like we can't protect our family. You have the sickness. This is horrible. Pray to the Holy Spirit. He'll strengthen you. So at Mass, little Abby, who was then three years old and not speaking. You barely say her name. Couldn't do even glottal stops. Um, when, uh, in between the two parts of the Novus Ordo, we were going to the Novus Ordo uh, back then, uh, didn't know about the Latin. Oh, we, we hadn't re-gone to the Latin Mass since we'd gotten back into the States. We'd gone about five years before. In between the two parts where we were kneeling, we were standing uh, at the consecration, and Abby starts chanting which is weird, whisper chanting, because she didn't speak. She could say agging for her name, Abby. She's saying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Not in her small 15 to 25 word vocabulary at that point. It was all very, very muddled. She's a great talker now. Nearly 14-year-old Abigail. But um, we, Abby is the saint of our family, and it makes total sense that 16 hours before, I was told, pray to the Holy Spirit, and Abby begins chanting to the Holy Spirit. I'd been coming back into the church slowly for five, six years. I mean, I'd I'd been studying Thomas Aquinas in Rome intellectually. I knew he was the smartest man ever, but I wasn't fully there yet until that moment. And I was like, okay, it's all real. (laughs) And thank you, Michael O'Brien, if you're out there. And and now I want to go to that next marker where he says something similar that happened to him, and it's related to Father Elijah and... Because he's such an honest, holy man, I take him at his word. It basically shows Father Elijah is private inspiration, which guarantees why it's so prophetic and entertaining at once. What book can be prophetic 25 years prior and entertaining at once? Can we play that uh, second clip, Steffi? I'm going to let this roll. Pay attention to what he says. You cannot not read Father Elijah after hearing this. If you've already read the book, you can't reread it. After here, you cannot not reread it with after having heard this. Pay attention here. Well, that was a good experience. Maybe the grandchildren someday will read this and they'll they'll enjoy. It. Yeah. Can you pause real and quick? I really... He's talking about he'd written a couple of books. The Canadian, you see what integrity the man has. Uh, the Canadian secular publishers had uh, rejected his other books. They're what Stephen King calls trunk novels. And he's like, whatever, I'm a sacred artist, I'm not a writer. Very humble man. He's a very good writer. Um, He dusted off. He'd had a couple trunk novels for years because they said, look, we can make you a success like he said in the previous clip. I'm not willing to become a pimp, so whatever, I'll keep being poor with six kids and I don't need to be a success in this life. I'd rather be holy. Rather live the fullness of the faith, which Canada Canada at the time in the government, church and state, was really amping up how much they oppressed those who lived in the fullness of the faith. He explains that in the couple minutes I, I skipped. Now he's saying, well, I put aside the couple novels I'd written, which he ended up submitting to Ignatius as his second and third Ignatius book, if I'm not mistaken. They did publish, eventually. Now he tells the story of Father Elijah. Here we go.
Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. We'll start it over here. <laughs> oh, boy. That's the 1848. Uh, but is it on fast? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. We accidentally muted it, so we'll start it over. My bad. That was a good experience. Maybe the grandchildren someday will read this and they'll, they'll enjoy it. Yeah, okay. And I really sincerely let it go. And then one day, uh, I think it was mid 90s, it would have been 94, 95, I was living in the middle of the Canadian church and the Canadian political milieu, which is which was at that point really ramping up uh, into an anti-life society. I and mean, Canada has been well in advance of all the moral revolution. I wouldn't call it advanced, well, but I would yeah, say uh, further along in the decline. Yes, well put. <laughs> and uh, we, were the, we were had open abortion long before Roe versus Wade. We, we were the first to have the third country in the world to have same-sex marriage legalized throughout the country, and all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. uh, the penalization of normal, traditional families uh, through taxes, tax laws. Uh, at every turn in our society, the rewarding of those who are sterile, the heaping of burdens upon those who uh, are open, totally open to life and live the fullness of our faith. So being bottom, bottom feeders, as, as we sometimes thought of ourselves, this uh, created uh, many pressures, many tensions. Uh, and one day I was in our parish church and just crying out to the Lord uh, in prayer. I was, we were caretakers of this little country parish, so, and we had the key, so we could go in there every day and pray. So one day I was in a pit of total discouragement. I had six children to raise, uh, and I was, I was not making it. I had given my whole life to sacred art, and it was just year after year of struggle. And I was... I was pleading with the Lord. I was I was kneeling in front of the cross and, and kissing it and crying. Now that's not something I like to admit. Definitely not. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's a long time ago now. <laughs> and uh, I was weeping. And I, I was saying, I'm finished, Lord. Wait, it's over. I can't go on. And I, and the church in our country at that time was in a particularly low phase of undeclared apostasy and betrayal of the faith on many levels, no need to go into that at the moment. But let us say, there was very little to support those who choose uh, to live the totality of the Gospels as Roman Catholics, the fullness of our faith, within our particular churches, as well as the larger configuration around us in the politics and social generation. So, total discouragement. So I was just crying out to the Lord, and I... I pleaded with him. I said, don't you see? Don't you see what's happening? Um, and I suppose a lot of, of self-pity is there too. Don't you see what's happening to me? <laughs> so, but really weeping and pleading from the heart in a way that I had not until then. I said, don't you see what a desolation this has become? This is Your church is a desolation here, Lord. And at that instant, I don't know how to describe this adequately, but there was this total interior stop, um, silence. Um, this supernatural peace flooded me, and this it had no crazy. rational content, but it was like presence, the total presence. The Lord was in the tabernacle, in the Blessed Sacrament, and I knew that, but now it was, I could feel that presence in a way I hadn't until that, that instant. And I heard an interior voice that said, in this place of desolation, I will give fruitfulness. And I was still in my, my filthy, despairing, black Irish mood. <laughs> that I pushed it away. I thought it was a distraction. I thought, yeah, 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 yeah. That's my subconscious talking. And then the word came again. And with it, a greater peace. And so then I stopped. Then I shut up. I just rested in this peace. And then there came this instruction. Go and read the scripture. So I stood up from the cross, and I went up to the lectern on the altar, and I opened the lectern, I opened the lectionary, <coughs> and the first thing my eyes lit on was a passage from the Old Testament, one of the wisdom books. Forgive me, I didn't write it down. Uh, I, I can't now remember where it was, but it said, in this place of desolation, I will give fruitfulness. <laughs> I mean, this is seconds after my... My exact. immense complaining to God. Rational content. No, that was that was cool. That just silenced me totally. And this peace just pushed away all my mood of discouragement and fear and, and hopelessness. 
But I didn't know what it meant. How on earth would God give fruitfulness through me? You know, this a very small, poor man and weak man. At that very moment, I, well, I did kneel down. I knelt down and I said, thank you. Thank you, God, for this. Thank you for this word, for, for giving me hope, this word of encouragement. And at that moment, uh, totally to my surprise, this whole story of Father Elijah just flooded into my imagination. I began to watch this movie. I just knelt there for an hour watching, watching this interior movie. Now, this does not happen to me. I have a big Irish imagination. This certainly never happens like that. And there was, again, this, this supernatural peace with it. Uh, it was just the whole form of the work was, was there, given, and also an uh, instruction, or a sense of instruction, not literal words, that I should go and write it down. I should write this story in the form of a novel, which I did. And at the time, I was kind of a, an editor of a small Catholic family magazine, so I had a tiny, a tiny bit of an income that allowed me, for the next eight months, to write the novel, Father, which eventually became Father Elijah. I've never written anything so easily. In terms of writing, it has flaws, but, but the flow of the work. Okay, so you wrote this now. Yeah. Did you send that to the main line? Okay, so he's going to go on to explain how... Um, well, well, we'll get back to the third clip, but I just want you to see that it's a conditional claim. If Father Elijah is truly prophetic and truly, like, I, I don't want to... <laughs> heap so much praise on it that you say I'm being hyperbolic, but if it's so entertaining, such a well-written, exciting book, and it's faithfully Catholic, it's it's a Vatican spy novel, similar to Windswept House, but much faster paced and much different. The Pope tasks this protagonist, Father Elijah, with falling in, because he's a he has a PhD, falling in with the president of the European Union, basically, who is, the Pope believes, the Antichrist, falling in with his glittering crowd through a technicality in Father Elijah's dissertation and um, converting him, converting him as a kind of double agent, triple agent uh, novel. I, I, tons of scary, diabolic, spooky, demonic things are happening. Tons of Lord of the Rings references, fun good guys, solemn good guys. Father Elijah is a lot more like... Um, I think O'Brien himself, but if it's that good a novel and it's that holy and faithful, it almost stands to reason that it would be privately inspired. And then you have this most humble guy never trying to build a book, the most humble guy who's willing to continue to be poor with a family of eight with his other couple of novels, which are very well received novels once they got published, but said, you know, conditionally to the big secular publishers. No, if you make me cut my religious heart out just to publish these, then forget it. I don't want to do it. I'll keep being poor. That proves the guy's integrity. Once integrity, always integrity. So he's claiming, and he's not even trying to highlight it and make it the, the centerpiece on the marquee. He's just, in very dressed down terminology, he's telling us that this novel which has proven so, 25 years later, 20, 25 years later, so prescient. He's telling us that it's privately inspired. And when I read it, I've read it a couple times. I think I've read it three times. I'm about to read it the fourth. You see, to be that holy, that Catholic, that non-corny, that fast-paced, and that exciting, one of the, just one of the very best books I've ever read, novels, maybe the best, it has to be privately inspired. How do we know? Because Catholic and Christian art, any of the fine arts, are generally speaking crap. And we need to get better. We need to use the Father Elijah model for Catholic and Christian art. There's nothing corny or hokey or goody two-shoes about it. It is just the most exciting novel I've ever read. And it calls all this stuff out. 25 years ahead of time. So I, I think that's really amazing. Could we uh, fast forward to clip 27? I'll leave you with that. We're doing, we're starting the reading group of Father Elijah, patrons only, all levels of Patreon, from the $5 level per month up on June 21st. Now you won't, I, I have to hesitate to tell you guys to become patron, you know, 
uh, supporters in late May because people get mad because you get charged for the whole month of May if you go on 11.59 on May 31st. Now we're into June. Register for Patreon. Support Timothy J. Gordon today. We're doing this group reading of the book. It is so much fun reading it together. It's so much fun reading a novel in summer, the greatest time to read fiction. And it's so much fun to read this novel, Simplicitaire. I really urge you to do it today. Become a Patreon patron. Uh, I want you to hear this third clip from the novel's most humble, most pious author, Michael O'Brien. I consider him a friend. We've only corresponded a little bit 11 years ago. But listen to this last clip. I'll let him bring us out. Just after you listen... Go become a, a Timothy J. Gordon Patreon patron today if you're not. If you already are, then just buy your book, Father Elijah, and get ready for June the 21st. We have two meetings that that uh, that week. It'll be the Fridays at about 8.30, my time. June 20, yeah, CST. June 21st is not a Friday. So we're going to do like a, I think it's a Tuesday or a Wednesday meeting, then that Friday too. And we'll record all of the meetings. That way, if you miss them, um, well, um, we'll record all the meetings. Just in that case, anybody who misses them, they'll be able to rewatch them as well. So, okay. So third here, clip. Yeah, third we'll clip. <laughs> and I don't think we're muted this time. So <laughs> let's see here. That's, that's a me mood. <laughs> okay, here we go. Well, I wrote it in, in obedience. And for six months after I wrote it, I said, there, I wrote it in obedience. I think my call is just to be someone who obeyed God and was here and was rejected and wasn't he found no place in the modern age but at least the word was spoken that's why i conceived it and then one day six months after completing the book, the book um your general manager tony ryan phoned me he'd come across a little book of rosary paintings that i had painted and my wife and i had self-published and he said I, I saw your rosary book uh, have you have you done anything else uh we might be interested to look at it and i said uh, Again, my fatalism and lack of real lack of faith. I, I said, well, well, yeah, I, I, I wrote a manuscript, a novel, but you wouldn't you wouldn't be interested because uh, I knew Ignatius Press was not publishing. We didn't publish novels, no, no. And and hardly any Catholic publisher was publishing fiction. It seemed to be have died out right. after the 1950s. Yeah. So I said uh, you wouldn't be interested, and uh, he said, well, we might be. He said, why don't you send us the manuscript? I said, I, I don't want to waste your time. I said, and besides, I said, I know you're a nice guy, but I gotta be frank. I said, I don't have ten bucks to pay for the postage to send you a manuscript that you're going to reject. And so Tony, with his uh, his great Irish uh, irony, said, "Send us the manuscript. We'll send you the ten dollars." <laughs> By the way, Father, he never did send us. What <laughs> was in your last probate check? Thank you. Was... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, two months later, a contract came. And it was like a miracle to me. Uh, Two months uh, later, that's kind of unusual. It would take as long to see books. I was I was totally stunned. Well, let me interject a bit in this beautiful story, you know, for the comic relief usually. <laughs> but uh, at Ignatius Press, you know, we're we live like a family of, in so, of a sort. Uh, we we have mass together in the morning and morning prayer, and we come to the angels together in, in midday prayer. So we're trying to be with the church and support the church. But none of us really had any experience in publishing. And, uh, I mean, the way we began, that's a whole long story, but once we did begin, uh, we didn't do marketing surveys or focus groups. Uh, you know, our idea was, we will publish what we like to read and what we think will help the church. Mm. You know, that was just our cartoon. It, it was a great thing to be able to say, hey, if we like it, maybe someone else will like it. Mm -hmm. And we hadn't published novels, and, and I'm not a literary critic, I'm not even educated in, in literature very well. I, mean, I, I was an engineer and a theologian. Uh, but the I remember getting the manuscript, another big, you know, manuscript. <laughs> We get it. I read. I couldn't put it down. I said, "Well, this is. I think this is good. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I can't tell you why. I can't defend it. But this, this to me seems like it's beautifully written. It's a wonderful story, uh, deeply spiritual and, and religious and Catholic. Uh, we passed it around. We said, "Hey, this is really good. We have to do this." So we didn't do it thinking that we're going to get rich on it, or you're going to get rich on it, or, or. So there you have it. It 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 is an amazing book. Ignatius Press, you know. We don't have to talk about what we think of their nonfiction division. God bless them. They opened up a fiction division for Michael O'Brien's generational book, uh, truly generational book. I mean, this is one of the great Catholic books of literature. It should be up there with Dante. It's hard to say that about a contemporary book, but that's what it is. God bless Father Fessio for having the vision to open up 
a fiction division because this book is so good and uh, and not not doing you know marketing surveys and, and things like that that which would have led Ignatius to to pimp out their fiction division in the same way that all of the secular publishers were. They published one of the greatest books of all time. We're always looking for the great American novel. O'Brien's Canadian. If you consider, you know, Canada part of North America, which which I do, then this is the great North American novel. It is unbelievable, and I'm really excited. Go buy your copy today if you plan to be part of the Father Elijah reading group. I'm really excited about it. It starts the first day of summer, June the 21st. There will be details uh, on you know that w- as we communicate them with uh, you, our patrons, on the Patreon page. We're really pleased to do this. By the way, my upcoming two shows will be on The Sham of Catholic Annulment, a show that just I've been waiting for someone to do for a long time. No one will touch it because it offends so many people. You're, you, this show is going to blow your mind. Uh, the sham of Catholic annulment. And then uh, that'll probably be on Monday. And then tomorrow I'm going to be responding to a Franciscan conference that's happening. I keep not getting invited to these conferences on topics like integralism, post-liberalism. Is America a tyranny? Was it supposed to be that way from all along? Was it founded on enlightenment principles. I can't get invited to these integralist conferences, so I'm going to respond in tomorrow's show. The the, the conference at Steubenville um, uh, begins tomorrow. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm friendly with some of the guys that are making presentations, but, but I, I have to get this out. So two big shows coming from my point of view, one tomorrow and one on Monday. Uh, fire, dynamite, uh, fireworks, in their own respective ways. I just wanted to put this show out there so you guys who are interested in reading Father Elijah or rereading it, in the case of a lot of you that I've corresponded with, you can know, okay, you got got, uh, a little less than three weeks to get your book. If you're not a Patreon patron, just become one. We do need the support. We need the help uh, to keep this channel up and going. And book clubs are going to be a way we're, we're looking to do so. God bless you all. Have a great pre-summer day and get ready for this amazing book club on June the 21st. Day as Volt, people.